So I am glad to introduce uh, Marius Manchik from uh, Nicolas Copernic University in Torun, who will uh, present a talk involving automorphism, multiplicative function, and also many other things. So thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, so many thanks to organizers for invitation and for the possibility to, to speak here. Also, I would like to thank the audience for the remaining for remaining. Uh, okay, so I will be talking about Sarnak's conjecture on Mebius orthogonality, and I will tell you something about our recent joint result with Hussein El Abdalawi and Thierry Delarue. Uh, so even though some basic objects were already introduced in several talks, so I will just briefly rec recall. So we are going to talk about Mebius orthogonality, so we'll just recall that Mebius function will be the main object of interest for us during this talk. So the Mebius function is the function taking three values on numbers, so 0, 1, and minus 1, 0 when the number is not square free, and then according to the, to the parity of, of prime divisors, it's 1, one or, or minus 1. So that, that's one of important functions in number, number theory. So I just wrote the Dirichlet series of, of this, of this uh, arithmetic function. And I, I, I just recall also that the prime number theorem is equivalent to the fact that the averages of the Mebius function are going to 0. And then if you have a speed, which is, which is written here, so then this is, this is equivalent to Riemann hypothesis. OK, so let's also recall that an arithmetic function is called multiplicative if, well, you have this, this condition whenever m and n are co-prime. So why we give this definition? So mu is, an, uh, is, is a nice example of a multiplicative function. Of course, each multiplicative function is, is, is determined by its values on, on powers of prime numbers. So another arithmetic function which is multiplicative, in fact, completely multiplicative, is, is, is Louville function. And, well, well he, the Louville function is, well, uh, also, well, appeared also during previous talks. Uh, okay, so Sarnak's conjecture, let's briefly recall. So what's, what's the point? So we have, a, we have a topological system. So homeomorphism of a compact, let's say, metric space. And we assume that the, the entropy, the topological entropy, we can speak only about topological entropy, is, is equal to zero. And then we want to see that for these observables, so for, if we take any, any continuous function g, we want to see that this is orthogonal to the Mebius function. Uh, OK, so it's, so well now I have a slide with, with well, what, what was done so far. But each time I have to modify this slide, and I, I don't want to use more than one page. So then I have to somehow make a selection, and sorry if something is missing here. Uh, so I divided examples or results into some groups. So the first one is just, this is just these are just historical examples. Of course, at that time, so when we, uh, I mean, like, you know, prime number theorem or prime number theorem arithmetic progressions of or the result Sebastian mentioned uh, of Davenport. So of course they were proved before some conjecture was formulated. But well, they can be read now. They can be interpreted in in, in the language of of. of of Sarnak's conjecture in the sense that, for example, prime number theory is, exa is exactly the statement that Sarnak's conjecture is true for the one-point system. Uh, and then, well, we have some series of results. So, so these are, so the results were, or the Sarnak conjecture was confirmed for dynamical systems of algebraic origin. So there are, there are some papers by Bourguin, Sarnak, and Ziegler. Then, so this is for horror cycle for then for, for near systems for some, well, let's say, in, gen in general, algebraic systems on, uh, on, on, homogeneous, on homogeneous spaces. Then there are some, some examples which, well, I don't know how to call exactly, but maybe closer to smooth dynamics. Uh, so so th this was mentioned by, by well, 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 
by, by Sebastian uh, and uh, the recent results by, by Sebastian and Christian, and then there, there's a new result by Karagulian uh, about interval maps and homeomorphisms of this, uh, of this circle. Then, well, there are results which are, let's say, these are systems which are more of measure theoretic origin. So rank, rank one maps were, were somehow mentioned before, then there are some unsized products that they were defined, well, in, also in some previous, previous talks, by, for example, by Alejandro. So, well, so you have, you have some results, and maybe if you think about the number of results, so then somehow the, the, the last group is, 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 is the winner. So these are, these are dynamical systems of number theoretic origin. So you have results that, 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 that somehow tell us something about dynamical systems or some particular functions in dynamical systems that are given by generalized small sequences, uh, Teplitz sequences, well, rudin shapiro sequence, well, uh, the first, I mean, the talk by Michael Drumota, which we had the first day, it was also, he was presenting some completely new results about uh, automatic sequences. Well, so we have many results of that type. But, but this is, in a sense, this, this talk will not be to show you another class of examples, but it will be something a little bit more. So let's see in which direction we are going, or what is the problem with the conjecture of Sarnak. Uh, so uniquely ergodic models. Uh, so uh, first of all, well, topolo uh, a topological system is called uniquely ergodic if it has exactly one invariant measure. So now what we are going to consider is the following situation, that we have a measure theoretic system. So it's just an automorphism preserving a measure, so we have a probability space. No, there is no structure on, on the underlying probability space. And there is no assumption on this, on this R. It's, not, not, it's nothing continuous. So it's just a measure theoretic dynamical system. Now we, we are going to talk about topological models of this, of this system. In fact, what we are interested in is these are uniquely ergodic topological, uh, topological systems, which somehow well, are the same as the original measure theoretic system. In which sense? So in, in the sense which was oh, well, there was a lecture by Sebastian, right, yesterday, and I think it was, was exactly the same idea that what we want to see is that we, we, we start with a measure theoretic system, then we look for a topological model which has exactly one measure, and as, so now we have two measure theoretic, measure theoretic systems, and we want to see them measure theoretically isomorphic. So let's see, let's see, well, something at least, some, some comments on that. So uh, there is this classical theorem by Jewett Krieger, which tells us, OK, every, every measure, of, uh, measure theoretic system, dynamical system has a, has a uniquely ergodic model. So now uh, uh, the second example I, uh, I gave is just one point dynamical system. So let, maybe for people, I mean, I, I know that for specialists, it's what I'm going to talk is, is completely trivial. But maybe for those who, who see this for the first time, maybe it will be somehow instructive. So let's, let's start with the most trivial dynamical system. I mean just one point. OK, and so I will, in fact, I will interpret this in as a subshift. So, so we have the space of 0, 1 sequences. And if I want to have a, a dynamical system, which is just one point dynamical system, so I'm just taking, I'm just taking a point which consists of all zeros. So if you, if you consider a shift here on that, on that space, so this is just shift, so this is nothing but, but, but a fixed point. So we take the orbit, which is completely trivial, is just one point. Clearly, this is a topological model for one point dynamical system, uniquely ergodic. But is, is that all? So now you can imagine the situation. OK, so I have my fixed point. So let's call this point A. So this is my fixed point. So this is one trivial orbit. But now I, I, I have a point B. And what I see is that when I look at its orbit, so it's somehow going, let's say, forward and backward. It's just going to this point A. So if you want to see concrete examples, so just take this as before. 
and just replace one zero by one. And now if you look at the orbit of this, of this point B, so it will behave exactly this way. It will approach zero from, uh, I mean, backward and forward. And of course, the system which we obtain is also a uniquely ergodic model of the, of the, of the, of the one-point dynamical system. So now, uh, is, is that all? No, it's still not, not all, because you can complicate this picture by adding a third point. So let's say C. And now what I want to see is that, well, I, I look at the orbit of this point, so it will somehow well, go to A, but it will also go to B. So let's, let's do this in the following way. So we st still we are going only to modify this sequence of zeros, and we just put ones, both sides. And the only, th the only thing which we require is that the number of zeros between the consecutive ones is going to infinity. So now you see what's, go what's going to happen. So this, the orbit of this point is going to oscillate between these two points. But most of the time, it will be it will spending close to the point A. And if you think about uniquely ergodic models of one-point dynamical systems, so these are th that's it. I mean, the, I mean, th these are all phenomena w which may happen. So in other words, you have to have a fixed point, and then each orbit is attracted by this fixed point on a subset of density of, of density one. If you think about two points, so I will come back to these two points. So we'll see that the situation is as trivial as it is here, and somehow it's much more complicated if you think about Sarnak's conjecture. So okay, so that's that's what we have here, and then the well. So it was mentioned of the Sturman dynamical systems are all the uniquely ergodic models of, of irrational rotations. So we know that for irrational rotations, Sarnak's conjecture holds. Well, so does it hold for, for example, for these? uniquely ergodic models. Well, uh, of course, I should also mention that if we start with a, with a zero and measure, uh, if you think about measure uh, theoretic entropy, we start with a system of zero entropy. So then the topological entropy in each its uniquely ergodic model will be zero because of, of the variational principle. So it's, well, uh, we can start with Sarnak's conjecture. So a natural question arises, and somehow we cannot avoid this question, or, or the answer to this question, thinking about giving positive solution to, to Sarnak's conjecture, is the following. So suppose that we, so we start with a measure theoretic dynamical system, then we take its uniquely ergodic model, and suppose we, we, we proved somehow using some ad hoc methods, uh, we proved Sarnak's conjecture in this particular model. So can we somehow deduce that it is true in all models of, of, this, of this measure theoretic system. Well, so I, I wrote that this is true for uniquely ergodic models of the one-point system. So remember that Sarnak's conjecture is, is to, to look at the expressions of that form. But if you have one point, if you have a uniquely ergodic model of one point dynamical system, so the, the, the issue is that if you take this x, it will be attracted by a fixed point on a, on a subset of density one. So here we have a subset of density zero, which is, which is bad. But because we are averaging, we don't care about such a set. So in other words, we, can, we may think that this function is something like a constant function, and we come back to the prime number prime number theorem. So now let's, now, uh, let's now come back to this to the study of these very simple dynamical systems and just take two points. So now I take system which is rotation on two points. So Sarnak's conjecture holds because of prime number theorem in, in arithmetic progressions. But what happens? if we take any uniquely ergodic model of this system. So we can make th the same analysis as before. So in such a model, we have to see that each orbit is attracted by the orbit. So we have now this point A. We have this point SA. So you can guess that 
what I'm going to consider is, let's say, such a, such a periodic point in the, in, in the shift space. And now what we are doing is that first, I'm just, so the first thing is that we just forget about one zero. And then we will create an orbit, a, a point whose orbit would somehow go to the orbit of, of this, of this uh, I mean, to this periodic orbit. But, and then, but then, so this is this, this point, this point B. And the point C, it, uh, it will be simply, we are going to, to give, I mean, to erase infinitely many zeros. Again, just taking care of the fact that the distances between these consecutive uh, deleted zeros are going to infinity. Uh, and then what happens? So this is my point C. So what happens now? So if I look at the orbit of this point C, so it is, of course, so it's somehow coming close to, the, to this periodic orbit. And then staying some time, then leaving, going to, to the orbit of B, and then returning, etc. But the point is that telling, telling you that I'm going to be close to this periodic orbit at a certain, so in other words, I have this SMC. I cannot tell you if I am coming close to this orbit starting from A or starting from SA. So in other words, if you look at this expression, so maybe I will write this expression in the following form, which somehow will reappear soon. So is that <coughs> mu of n. So now what we are going to see is that, well, I didn't precise what, is, what are these BKs, but just so this, of course, the only thing which matters if I take a continuous function, these are values of this, of this function, these two points. So let's say it's plus or minus one, plus one or minus one. But now because I'm just erasing these zeros, so in fact, I, at each time I will change parity. So in other words, this mu n will be multiplied either by one or by minus one, but it depends on the interval. So in other words, we have a certain property of, of Mebius function and, well, a few months ago I would say, and this is open, right? If the property which I, which I wrote is true, this arithmetic property. For now it's, today maybe it's not, it's not, not that obvious what, what is the status of of the Sanax conjecture in uniquely ergodic model on two points. Okay. So maybe I'll, because I already lost a lot of time, let's let's go. So again, so let's 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 try to talk about. Suppose that the so our question is that we want to see that Sanax conjecture not only holds for one particular top uniquely ergo, uh, one particular uniquely ergodic model of a, of a transformation, but we want to see that this is, this is just true for all such models. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's introduce some, some new notions. So, so this, is, this is pure ergodic theory. So we have, we have measure, measure theoretic dynamical system, and we are talking about the property of asymptotical orthogonal powers of, of this transformation. And what, what we want to see is that if we fix two functions in L2, so let's say with integral zero, uh, so then what we want to see is that, okay, so I take powers of this transformation, so power r, little r, power little s, and we look at all possible joinings. So in other words, we look at all possible measures which are invariant under the product of these two transformations and with right projections. And what we want to see is that if R and S are large enough, so in fact we want to see that this, this, is, this is small. So of course I could have phrased this using metric on the space of joinings, but that's because, well, not everybody here is, is, is an expert, so uh, let's, let's just look at such, uh, such an elementary condition. So this is this AOP property. Uh, so one thing is that, well, you may, you may imagine, this, you, you can imagine the situation that 
if you look at different powers of a transformation, so they are in fact disjoint in the sense of Furstenberg. This happens, and then of course, it, this disjointness means that the only possible measure here which I can put is just product measure, and, and, the, and, this, then, and this condition is trivial. But the point is that this property can be satisfied for transformations uh, for which we don't have this jointness of, of, of powers. If you think about irrational rotation, so if you, by alpha, if you take power R, R, so this is R alpha, if power S, it's S alpha, but they have a common factor, which is rotation by R S alpha. So there is no, no disjointness. In fact, you can even, you, if, you can even have examples which behave like horror cycle flows. I mean, in the sense that all powers are isomorphic, but nevertheless, if you look at powers, so the transformations will become more and more independent. OK, and this property implies zero entropy, so it's still a good category of object. And here, here is, well, let's say the first result. So suppose that we have a transformation which is t totally ergodic. And it, is, it has this property that if we look at large powers, so they, they are somehow more and more independent. So now suppose that we have a uniquely ergodic model of such, such, a, such a transformation. Uh, take any multiplicative function. Take any function and you find this condition. So of course, you can take for you the Mebius function, and then you obtain that Sarnak's conjecture holds. So what's, what's important here is that R is totally ergodic. OK. So now we had, so this was theorem A, and now look at theorem B. So we suppose that we are in the previous situation. So we have, we take directly a uniquely ergodic model. We assume that we have everything which we had at the, in the theorem before. And so we, we have orthogonality to all, uh, to all mu uh, multiplicative arithmetic functions. But now it, what happens is that, in, is that if we take any increasing sequence of integers and any, any sequence of, of points in x, then for each multiplicative function, we have, this we have this expression going to 0. So think about the situation that all these x k's are equal to x. So then uh, you come back to this sort of expressions. So in other words, it is, it is not Sarnock, right? It's something much, much stronger, right? Because instead of following one, the same orbit, you, uh, at a certain moment you can jump, you can choose a completely different point. And of course, it's not something that you, you take different points because n is, gr so if you think about Mebius function, but you also, but mu n is going, I mean, you know, with, with time. It's not that you start counting, changing points, counting from the beginning. You just continue on, on, that, on, on, on that coordinate. So now let's look at some possible applications of that or consequences of that. So uh, consider the following algebraic uh, transformation of d-dimensional torus. So this is an affine transformation. So Tamara yesterday called these transformations Abramov transformations. So these are examples of Abramov transformations. So if you if you want the the most uh, well classical example is that this is going to x plus alpha, x plus y. So the parameters here are one zero one one. So this is this is this is this metric is a, a and then you have the vector alpha zero. So just the composition of automorphism plus a rotation plus a translation. So okay, so let's take this. I wrote this corollary because it will follow from a theorem which I will formulate in a while. But let's we know that this has this 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 AOP property. What does it give us? So now this is a, a classical calculation due to, to Furstenberg. Uh, OK, so we look at this transformation. And we are going to well deal with not this expression, but with this. We, we are going to change points, uh, looking at the last coordinate and taking a character depending on this last coordinate. So then the, the last coordinate you can compute. It's just a polynomial expression in n. 
In fact, that's what Fersenberg proved, is that each polynomial, so you see, if you, if you start with a polynomial, let's say, with leading uh, irrational coefficient, so that you can, you, can, you can choose alpha x1, xd, so that you have the, the mod 1, you have this equality. So now take any b1, b2, etc. Take point xk, so I, I have to choose now a sequence of points. So I don't, I'm not changing these guys. They are, they are somehow determined by my polynomial, but I'm adding tk on the last coordinate. And this tk will be, you will, we will see in a while. So we apply theorem b. Okay, theorem b is that, well, on the, on the last coordinate, we, we replace x d by x d plus tk, so that's why this tk is going here. So now, this is, this is a number of modulus 1, or, or if you like, because bk is fixed, everything what I see here in this sum is known to me, it's, it's, it's a complex number. So now I can multiply this complex number by a number of modulus 1, and I end up with, the, with, with just the absolute value of, of, of this sum. Okay, so, this gives us the following theorem, that if we have uh, uh, any multiplicative function and uh, we take any increasing sequences, any, 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 any polynomial with, let's say, irrational leading coefficient, so that then we have this. So this is to be compared. So, so we had this, and then, well, somehow, Nikos Franzikinakis noticed that if you take this particular case, Pn alpha n, so then, in fact, this was already or you can deduce this from a recent result. There is a series of result, recent results by Matomeki and Rajivu, and Matomeki, Rajivu, and, and, and Tao. Uh, so if you take here alpha n, so then you will, you will have, uh, so, so it, it was, well, let's say it can be deduced from the other paper. And if you want to see, so in fact, this, this theorem C can be reformulated, and we obtain the following result, which somehow tells us about the behavior of such expressions on, on what's called short intervals, but in average. So in when most of the intervals are good, most of these short intervals are good, but some of them perhaps are bad. So that's, that's mainly Matomeki and Trajivium. And well, so this, uh, these tools which we are developing now and somehow permitting us to, to have this result, but I mean, it's just going to zero. There is no quantitative result. You cannot obtain a quantitative result here. Okay, so we saw some potential applications of, of that. So let's uh, try to see now how to get to this theorem A and to, the, to this theorem B. What is behind that? So but Sebastian already mentioned that, well, there's one crucial result here, which is due to Burgen, Sarnak, and Ziegler. Then it turned out somehow that it was proved before in, in pure number theory. So now it's called this KBS uh, as Z criterion. And I formulated this cr criterion in, 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 in this way. So it's, we have a bounded, bounded sequence. We want to see that this bounded sequence is orthogonal to any multiplicative function. So what we have to know? So it turns out that we should look at subsequences which are given by R, Rn and Sn. Rn, Sn are, there are no Rn? Ah, oh, yes, okay, Rn, Sn, so these are different prime numbers. So, and he, so here you have an expression. It tells you that, well, if you look at Rs sufficiently large, so then you should see that this is small. In fact, if you look at the paper, the original paper, this is, it's not formulated this way. It's, Somehow, you have to see that this is also true and, and repeat the proof. Okay. So now we'll uh, recall this, this property, this ergodic property, A, AOP. So we have to look, so when we fix F and G, we look at, the, then we consider all possible joinings between powers of these transformations, and we want to see that somehow when R and S are big, so then this expression is small, uniformly in all joinings. All right, that's something. So if we think about the, now this theorem A, so that's the following reasoning, which somehow shows us that for uniquely ergodic systems, there is a relation or deep relationship with, of Sarnak's conjecture with, uh, with joinings, which was already mentioned by, by Sebastian. So, of course, if this, this AOP property, it's a measure theoretic in, invariant, so if it holds for, 
for this system, so it holds in, its, its, in each of its unique ergodic models. So we fix such a model. So then uh, we take a point, we take a function f, we take an epsilon. So now, because of our assumption, we know that this, the value of this integral is small, whichever, whichever ergodic joining we take. So on the other hand, once this y is fixed, so we look, we look at this uh, Dirac measures. And we are following all, so you see that we are considering the, the product transformation s to the power r and s to the power little s. And we are just looking at the orbit. So of course, so this is a sequence of measures in a compact space. So then it, con uh, well, along the subsequence, it converges. So let's, let's look at the limit. If you look, if you use now the fact that the transformation s is totally ergodic, so it's here we use this fact that all powers are ergodic. So then you end up that this row has to be a joining. So this row is a joining, and then we have something which is called an ergodic decomposition of this joining. This is all correct. I, I repeat once, once more is that this is because these powers are ergodic. Otherwise, it, it all collapses, and in fact, without this assumption, uh, this theorem is false. OK, so now because if we take this function is continuous, so we have this convergence. On the other hand, we can compute this, this integral by, by taking our ergodic decomposition. And because we know that this, this integral here in absolute value is small uniformly in kappa, so then we end up that this expression is small than kappa, which gives us that this limb soup is small than kappa, because we, we, we can play with any subsequence here. So now the result is just a consequence of, of KBSZ criterion. Okay, so now uh, how to cope with, uh, with this theorem B. So the theorem B, the idea is that, okay, so I am in a uniquely ergodic system, but I cannot do any, well, so what can we do? Okay, I, I have an irrational rotation, so what can I do with that? So the idea is that, in fact, if we have one uniquely ergodic model, so we can build a, a family of uniquely ergodic models, just, start, just having two parameters, this, these are the, these sequences, increasing sequences of natural numbers, and then a choice of points. So how do we do it? So we take a point in, so, so the idea is that we, we take pieces of orbits of these points, and we put them in one big space, which is just, just the product space, x to the n. And now we take, so now in that space, we have, we have the shift, we take the closure of that, and what we, so this is, this is our space y, and what we have to prove is that the system which we obtain is uniquely ergodic, and it is another model of the system we started with. So this is, well, let's say, a proposition, and you can see that this really holds, and the, idea, <laughs> the reason for that is that, well, you change, well, okay, it's just that the only measure which we obtain is just the measure which is given to us by, by graphs. So that's why we obtain, uh, we obtain a, a, a model, a uniquely ergodic model of the original, original transformation. So now the proof of theorem B is that we take the conclusion of the theorem A, in our system, then we take this new model and we apply uniquely ergodic model and we apply this theorem in this model for any function which depends on the first coordinate. Okay, so. But it's still, we had this transformation. And in fact, we didn't prove that we can apply our theorem to this transformation, in fact, to many other transformations. So here is when this Abramov automorphisms, they, they, they appear. So let's recall the definition. So we have a probability space. Then we consider, well, measurable functions of modulus 1. So that's, that's a group. And suppose that we have an ergodic automorphism of that space, and then we, we have a homomorphism of this group, which is just taking, well, like multiplicative co-boundary associated to this function f. So think now about eigen, eigen values 
So these are numbers of modulus one. You, you may think also that these are functions, just constant functions. And then uh, for each k, we define, we define a new group. So this, this is a certain group of functions of modulus one, such that when, when you take the cobandary or associated to, to this function f, so you, you fall in the group which is, which is previous. So, so the first step, you start with numbers. So the first step, it will, it will give us eigenfunctions. But then the second step, will tell us, okay, some of these eigenfunctions will serve as eigenvalues for the next step, eigen, eigen, eigenfunctions. So that's how it goes. So the elements of, of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of this group are called quasi-eigenfunctions. So now there's, there is a, this proposition which tells us that if we have a totally ergodic automorphism, and if we take, if we take uh, well, two functions, So the only possibility, so we can, okay, so now uh, uh, I want, I have to study joinings between the powers of these transformations. What I want to, I would like to see that this is, this is small. Why not to think that this will be simply equal to zero? Perhaps except of some finitely many, finitely many, many cases. So there is a certain, so this is a, a little bit, well, maybe misleading, but what we are going to see, so that there is a certain equation to be solved. So somebody is giving to us two functions, f and g. And what we are going to, to look at, these are, <laughs> this is for how many, for how many rs, there are some assumptions on rs, these are co-prime numbers, can we solve Can we solve the, the equation that the integral it's what the rho is different from zero? I, mean, I should have written here there exists rho, which is an ergodic joining between TR and TS. Okay, so this is a certain equation to be solved. So it turns out, so the lemma says that, or this proposition says that there is only one solution. So for the general case, it's it's rather well, uh, well, you have to do something, but let's see, because, well, why not, why not to prove at least that Sandak's conjecture holds for all uniquely ergodic models of irrational rotations. So let, let's just think that T is a rotation. T is an ergodic rotation. For how many R and S can we solve this? Well, so do I have to solve for any f and g? Well, this condition, you can see that this is clearly a linear and L2 closed condition because we are considering joinings. So I don't need to consider all functions. It's enough to consider functions which are eigenfunctions, right? We have, we have discrete spectrum transformation. So we suppose that we have, so this is fi. Then we have another eigenfunction cj, fj, and in fact, all we need to prove is that if we replace these functions by a pair of eigenfunctions, so then we will, there will be no too many solutions to this equation. Okay, so let's write this equation. So that's, this equation is like that. So the, the unknown for us is this, this measure rho. Okay. So now this, we can write that this is fi1 multiplication 1, no, this is tensor here, fj. So in other words, I have functions which depend on one coordinate. I look at them as functions depending on two coordinates. So this, this function, fi, was, was, a, was an eigenfunction. What about this function? Well, this function, if I, if I look, so this is the function fi. If I, so this is a function of two coordinates now. If you look at tr cross t to the s, so you see that only one coordinate, in fact, because we are considering a joining and the function depends on, the, on one coordinate, so we can just forget on what is happening on the second coordinate. And we'll end up that this is cir 
times the same function. And the same for the second one. But now wait. I mean, if, so this is, this calculation we can make for any joining. So it means that this product here, this integral here, I can compute as, well, I can think about the situation that these two functions are orthogonal in L2 space of, of my joining. But these are eigenfunctions. To know that eigenfunctions are orthogonal, the only thing I, I have to know is that the eigenvalues are different. So the only thing which you have to solve is just an elementary, just, just an exercise. Suppose that you have two numbers, ci and cj, which are irrational. You want to see now that for how many r and s, for how many pairs, you can see that cir is equal to cjs. And clearly, if these two numbers are irrational, there is only one, at most one solution to this equation. So that's, that's how it goes. So finally, uh, transformations with quasi-discrete spectrum these are transformations for which quasi eigenfunctions uh, form a dense, or linearly dense set in L2. And this condition is added for some reasons. This must be totally ergodic. So the main theorem which we proved is, is it was exactly that quasi discrete spectrum transformations, they have this AOP property. So now, OK. So, this, uh, so it was already in the paper of Abramov in 1962 that, in fact, there are models for such transformations. And these models are very algebraic. So these algebraic models, so they are given to us as the composition of, of, of an algebraic automorphism and a rotation. So there, there are compact, compact connected abelian groups, and you have, you have such a transformation, and there are some, some, there are some assumptions, right? There is this unipotence we have to know, otherwise we, you have problems with, with, the, with the entropy. So these are zero entropy transformations. And the, uh, the assumptions I made here, that they, I think, well, so these, all these transformations are minimal. And in this class, minimality implies unique ergodicity. So in a, in a recent paper by, by Liu and Sarnak, so they, for example, they prove that in, for these transformations, Sarnak's conjecture holds. But now what we have, I mean, if, if you want to compare now, this was what was said before, is that we know that it's not only true for this particular algebraic model, but it's true for all uniquely ergodic models of this transformation. And it follows that since it holds for all algebraic models, so then, in fact, in this particular, uh, excuse me, it, because it holds for all uniquely ergodic models, so we have a special form of Sanax conjecture in this particular algebraic model, because it is also uniquely ergodic. And so the result which you have, which can be rewritten using rather the language of Matomeki and, and Trajivu, so uh, it gives you uh, this orthogonality on short, short in, in, on, in short intervals in average. OK, so now uh, I have okay, still a few minutes. So so there's a question, of course, I mean, is it possible that this method works for maybe for all zero entropy transformations? Uh, so I, I want to show you an example, which is uh, somehow telling us that no, no, it will not hold for all of them. And of course, it would be extremely nice to have this new, I mean, this uh, the sauna conjecture on short intervals in average for horocycle flows, but for horocycle flows, it does this this property which we have does not hold. So let's let's see why it does not hold. So I said, of course, horocycle flows. If you think about different, uh, if you take powers, so let's we you, we take a horocycle flow, then we take type time type one map, then powers of of this transformation, and then of course they are isomorphic. Right? This is this is this is. This is very classical, and this is just follows from, from this uh, classical relationship between horocycle flow and ge geodesic flow. So they are isomorphic. But I already told you that the fact that powers are isomorphic, uh, it has nothing in common with this AOP property. Because just think that the point is that if you have graphs, so graphs can be, can be close to product measure. If you take 
mixing transformation, so the power of T is very close to, it's just the, 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 the essence of mixing, right? The powers of a transformation are close in weak topology to, to, product, to the product measure. So it's not this, it's just matter how these graphs are uh, somehow located. And so let's see what's happening on, uh, in the case of horocycle flow. So we have, so now we think that we have this R and S, so these are natural numbers. So the, what we are going to see is, so these are, let's say, R and S are prime numbers or co-prime numbers. We want to see that uh, the ratio is, so R is smaller than S, but, well, they are, cl they, they are close. So now the number, so th this number U, which appears here, it's small in the sense that it's close to zero. Uh, so now, so, uh, so of course this equation means that the, the graph joining associated to this G sub U is a joining between these two times of horocycle flow. But, but remember that this U is very small. So in particular, U is positive and small. So in other words, certainly what I am considering now is a sequence of, it's, it's a set of joining uh, which is indexed by, let's say, zero, one. So it's a compact, compact subset. It's a closed subset of joining. All of these joinings, because these are graph joinings, are different from product measure. So no chances, because well, wh whenever I t uh, now I have R and S just going to infinity, but still I can choose a joining which is in this set. So I will never achieve this AOP property. Okay, thank you. <laughs>